We're celebrating Palm Sunday today, and one of the things to notice about Palm Sunday is all the people involved. On the day that it happened, it says that the whole city was shaken by this event. All these people doing these things, the city was shaken. And within all those people, there also were different groups, lots of different groups with lots of different reactions to what the Lord was doing. And so we can imagine the Lord who knows the hearts of ev all the children of men, who knows every thought and every feeling within each person, him riding into Jerusalem, looking at each person in the crowd, and knowing what was going on for them. We can imagine him seeing his disciples' faces as the procession got going, seeing their excitement, knowing they had some selfish ambition in there, thinking they were going to be the rulers, um, and also the Lord knowing how hard the next week or so was going to be for those guys. We can also imagine the Lord seeing the crowd of people cheering for him, and here and there seeing a person that he healed, or a person that really heard one of the things that he taught and was moved and changed by it. Also probably seeing a few people that he could tell were just excited for the Romans to get thrown out of Jerusalem and knowing that that wasn't going to happen for them and they would be disappointed. We can also imagine the Lord seeing some of the chief priests and scribes in the crowd and their angry, indignant faces, their self-righteousness, their feeling that this is wrong, and their feelings of fear that their power was going to be threatened. And you can imagine the Lord's deep grief knowing each person that was not willing to change and turn back to him so that he could help them be free from that hellish stuff. And we can imagine the Lord also seeing the little children running along, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, repeating words that they'd heard the grown-ups say, not really knowing what they meant, but the Lord can picture a big smile on his face, feeling the innocence and sweetness from those children. So just picturing the Lord coming in and knowing all those people. Those were the people who he had come to save 2,000 years ago. But now let's talk about the people he's come to save today, in 2024. First, we'll talk mostly about how he's come to save you and me, uh, and then we'll talk more broadly about, at the end, how he's come to save all of us. So if I say the Lord's coming to save you, you might say, from what? That's a good question. What, what are we being saved from? What do you need help with? What kind of savior do you need? Well, I'm guessing you know some of the right answers. Uh, but I actually want to start by focusing on some wrong answers, and I'll tell you why. Because sometimes the wrong answers can get us to thinking about the places where we really feel like we need help, and places where we might not realize that the Lord can help us. Because we might know the Lord can save us from our sins, He can save us from hell, He can get us to heaven, and we know that those are good, important things, but those can sometimes feel disconnected from the things that really stress us and worry us and that we wish for. If you asked some of the people who were on the original Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago what they would wish for, they would have said to overthrow the Romans. And that wasn't really the right answer, but the Lord could work with that and bend it toward the right thing. So let's imagine a magical genie appeared and granted you whatever wishes you wanted. What would you wish for? Endless money, no more having to do work, no homework, no schoolwork, no uh, uh, chores. For the adults, maybe no more paperwork, no more answering emails, no more bills. Or maybe you'd think, no more fights. I want no more fights at home, no more fights at school, no more fights at work. Or asking the genie to maybe magically end the biggest and scariest things, no more wars. No more sickness, no more bad people doing bad things. Wouldn't that be great? Just have the genie just do all those things. Now, with those people 2,000 years ago, they had the wrong idea. The Lord was not going to overthrow the Romans. But he could take what they wished for and for some of them bend it toward what he actually wanted to do for them. He could teach them, my kingdom is not of this world. The thing to focus on is not the natural world, but the spiritual world, the heavenly kingdom. He could take what they wanted and bend it toward what he wanted to do for them. In a similar way, how can the Lord bend what we might want toward what he can do for us? So let's go through those things. The passage that we read 
from the, in the lessons talked about all these different powerful effects the Lord can have. Reforming us, regenerating us, which that means really changing how our minds think. And regenerating means changing our hearts, changing what we love, changing what we care about. And then all the things that go with that, that include renewing us and bringing us to life, making us holy, making us just, purifying us from evil, forgiving our sins, and saving us. All those good things the Lord wants to do for us. How does that relate to us maybe kind of wanting endless money? Well, I don't, I think we can figure out that the Lord's probably not going to give us endless money. But a lot of people have a lot of stress about money stuff, and can the Lord help us with that? Can He help shift how our minds think about money, shift what we care about in our hearts with money? I think He could do that. I think He could save us in that area. He could help us to be content with what we have. He could help us to be more generous with what we have. I think the Lord could help us in that area. How about no more schoolwork, no more homework, no more chores? Will the Lord magically get rid of all those things? I don't think so, but have you ever done chores and it was fun? That happens occasionally. Done homework and you learned something? The Lord can change how we feel about the work that we have to do to be less frustrated and more just accepting it and having peace and, and enjoyment there. That's pretty great. The Lord can help us there. How about no more fights? Wouldn't that be nice to be done with all the conflict? How can the Lord help us with this? Well, with fights, I think you know that different fights are quite different. So sometimes the Lord might help us to get help from other people to figure out what to do if it's a difficult situation. In other fights, the Lord might help us to figure out how to forgive the other person for the mean things they've done to us and reset. And other times, the Lord might help purify us from evils and forgive our sins by helping us realize we messed up and we need to apologize and try to do better. Because here's the thing, if we invite the Lord into our life as a Savior, He's going to make some changes. Just like when the Lord came into town, He didn't just parade through town and leave again. He came in and He went to the temple of God and He threw out the money changers and kicked over the seats of the people selling stuff. Sometimes when the Lord's working on us, it's going to feel a little bit like he's knocking over tables and kicking people out of seats. It's for our own good, but it's going to feel a little uh, disruptive sometimes. So how about that final area of like the big scary things, the things about like wars and sickness and bad people doing bad things? Well, I want to read you two short passages from the teachings of the new church that might help us. One says this, divine providence, that's how the Lord cares for us, is different from any other kind of leading or guidance in that it constantly has in view what is eternal and is constantly leading to salvation. It does throw, so through various states, sometimes joyful and at other times miserable, which we cannot possibly comprehend. But still, those states all make a contribution towards our eternal life. And another passage says, People who are regenerating are not reborn all at once, but constantly throughout their life and even in the other life. So these passages are saying that the Lord is constantly working toward what's best for each of us and all of us in the long run, in the big picture. And it's also saying that these things take time, that he's not going to sort these things out immediately. And it's even saying that things are going to feel pretty miserable some of the time but the Lord can still be helping and saving us. It's not a thing to say, well, the Lord's not going to do anything here, oh well. No, He can help us in the hardest and scariest things, the things that cause us the most stress, because He can change our minds and change our hearts about them, help us figure out what things we can do to help with these big problems, help us to hand what we can't handle over to the Lord, and help us to view things a little bit more from that long-term eternal perspective. Obviously, there's a lot more to talk about in there, but the invitation today is just to think about how the Lord could help you in those areas that might cause you the biggest amount of stress, even though he's not going to wave a magical wand and make them all go away. So finally, let's end by talking about how the Lord is coming to save other people too. The passage that we read from the teachings of the new church in the lessons goes on to say one more thing about these things that the Lord does. It says, it's important to know that the Lord is carrying out these salvation processes in every single one of us all the time. They are the steps to heaven. The Lord wants to save everyone, 
His purpose is to save all people. It is important to know that, to know that the Lord wants to help and save every single person that we'll ever meet. Every single person we meet and every pe- all the billions of people we never meet, he wants to save them. Just like he knew and understood and loved every single person he saw in the crowd 2,000 years ago, he loves and understands and cares about all the people that are alive today. And I invite you to think about this when we go outside, when we're standing out there feeling a little bit cold, waving palms, trying to sing a song together. Think about the other people in that crowd. Some of them you'll know very well. Some of them are your family members and your close friends. Some of them you kind of sort of know, and some of them you might not know at all. And to think that the Lord loves each of those people and knows each of those people. And some of them are going through exactly the same stuff that we're going through that's hard, and some of them are going through very different things. And one of the beautiful things to think about is that we can all be in different places in our lives, but all look to the Lord together. And we can see a picture of that when we all stand around together and try to welcome the Lord in as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What a wonderful thing to get to celebrate on Palm Sunday. Amen.